Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. England got pumped 3-0 in an ODI series that Moeen Ali called horrible before it even started. Don't worry, we won't spend too much time on that series on today's show. We will, however, be spending some time previewing England's test series against Pakistan that starts next week, as well as covering all the other headlines from the world game over the last seven days. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is Phil Walker and Ben Gardner. There is no Mark Butcher today. He's getting some rest ahead of next week's pod, the big chunky first test. Where's our rest? Preview. Um, we just keep going. We just keep going. Also, I've noticed that you don't give our titles anymore. I like it. I, d- I just think that our reputations most just people, go before us. I think people will probably guess that it's the Wisdom Podcast, so everyone on it, other than Butch, works. Well, Butch works with Wisdom as well. Butch is on yeah, the payroll. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true. Um, just a heads up that we've got not just one, but two of the all time great pod questions coming up later in the show. Um, I'm going to start with a searing hot take. The ODI series, um, and, and I get that it was a struggle to summon the energy to watch a lot of it. I was I was up at 3am on Saturday covering the second game. Uh, the games weren't great. Moeen called it horrible at the start. Um, but I get why it was played. England only have 12 confirmed games in the 11 months coming up to the World Cup. They played 10 T20Is in the month before the T20 World Cup. They were obviously very helpful. So there's not that much time. And with the schedule as it is, they do need to just play more ODIs. Um, and as horrible the series was to watch at times in front of basically no one particularly in the third game we have learned some things both teams have learned some things so therefore it was worth playing right that is a hot take right Mm. there yes or a lukewarm take actually yeah uh i i i echo that for what it's worth um i certainly echo the first bit uh that it has been tough to summon much energy for it uh, but I, I do tend to agree with you. And I found, while, while I adore Moeen as much as the next um, devotee of, of English cricket, I found that particular line, on the one hand, sort of refreshingly upfront and open, and, and Moeen is, is past being diplomatic and biting his tongue. He's, he's done too much. He's won too much. He's taken too many. He's scored too many to, to give a toss anymore. I get that. But the same token, that is a remarkable thing to say. <laughs> in and of itself, in the build-up to a game against your your greatest rivals. Now, if cricket wasn't so weird and dysfunctional, and if the structure wasn't such a hot topic as it is, and if players weren't so knackered, and also, it has to be said, emboldened by their own power, then there would be a lot more criticism of that line. And then when you see how disastrously from a cricketing competitive level the, the the game's played out then you would think that 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 comment and what that comment represents about where the mood is among the team would have got a lot more scrutiny but because it came on the back of a world win world cup win and because it does tap in to a fundamental problem that the game is having to confront and wrestle with people have shrugged their shoulders to it but if you take that in isolation you're going into a big well, not a big, but you're going into a, you, you, you're revisiting a pedigree rivalry, the rivalry of cricket, certainly from our perspective. And one of your main men who played certainly two games. Um, captain one of them. Captain one of them <laughs> shrugs his shoulders and says, you know, we'd rather be anywhere but this. Yeah, and there, there are lots of positions. That, that up, is remarkable, yeah. right? In and of itself. And there are lots of positions up for grabs, including Moeen's, by the way. I think he's far from guaranteed a spot for the first game at the World Cup. And with England's fixtures, the 12 games that they've got scheduled, three are against the Africa side that probably won't be at full strength. Three in Bangladesh, uh, three at home to Ireland and three at home to New Zealand at the end of next summer. And that's it at the moment. There, there probably will be a few warm-up games between the end of the English summer and the start of the World Cup, but they're not confirmed yet. So there, there was a lot to play for from English from an English point of view. And there are a lot of players who did have an opportunity to further, um, to, to push their claim for selection that really only David Milan took his, his 100 in the first game was, was genuinely excellent and it kept England in a game and kind of made it a game that otherwise would have been extremely one-sided. I suppose the weird thing is, is that you had uh, a group of players, like half of whom were had a lot riding on it. You know, for, this could well have been, say, James Vince's last game for England. It's not another question. It felt um, like that today. Yeah, and but then you also had half the team who, like like Moeen, just didn't want to be there. I mean, J- Joss Butler was uh, sort of having some fun and clearly just like 
not bothered at all about what was going on. I mean, you said at the end that we tried our hardest and it felt almost like a bit of a joke, basically. <laughs> he, he, then, also, he also dropped a classic line as well in the same interview with Isha at the end of the end of the whitewash. And he said, um, you don't need much of a memory to remember a week ago here <laughs> as he stood on the outfield at the MCG. So it's quite a clever line, really. Yeah. And, but, and, and you know, in, in the first game, he was sort of... Uh, reeling off all his sledges in quite unbutler fashion but yeah also he's, as really, if he's like really perked up yeah he, he kind of earned the right and was like almost showing them that, it, that they were kind of treating this as a bit of a, a beer match almost uh but yeah there, there was stuff to play for i mean it's and england do have quite a lot of questions to answer still ahead of that world cup i guess i don't know how much this series because of the weirdness of it has actually helped answer them i guess and also because of the lack of people who pushed their claims forward like roy now I mean, what he made a, a, a scratchy 30 odd in that last game, a duck and a six in the games before that. So he's averaging like 20 since the start of the English white ball summer, striking about 70 in that time, which is not great. But the thing that probably works in his favour, two things, I guess, looking ahead to what is that? Is it the New Zealand tour next or the South Africa tour? South Africa. South Africa. Um, is that we don't know when best we be back fit. And the fact that none of the other possible opening options really advanced their claims much i mean salt was unlucky to be obviously concussed in this last game but before that you know there wasn't a, a statement innings vince kind of played that 60 odd but then the shot that leads to the collapse and then a, he was also scratchy today uh, and i think with both of those there's sort of a sense that they've almost been second string for so long that that kind of england will when it comes to the point when they could make the first choice and England will think themselves well that was kind of for a reason are they players who we kind of like comfortable with coming in uh like in a needs must kind of situation but we're not quite happy to build a side around them with them in basically one of the two most important positions in the order uh milan is someone who could maybe open he could also bat at number four i think either of those positions are are possible and but england yeah what what do they even have set at the moment they have best i will open i guess they have root at number three and but somewhere somewhere in the middle order yeah but apart from that kind I of mean, it yeah there's i mean and and also what, they're also going to have to think about the balance of their side a bit as well because with no Stokes then actually they will might need sort of a more bowling heavy lower half because they won't have that insurance in the top so you might almost need a, a steadier top five or six than they've been used to it's because they'll be they'll, they'll just need they won't have that insurance lower down so there, there are a lot of questions mm. to answer but I don't know how much this series has helped them I guess just on Roy Obviously, his year has been bad. We all know that he got dropped from the T20 side on the eve of the World Cup. And he's always been a better ODI player, obviously brilliant in the 2019 World Cup. So I thought it was the right decision to retain him for this trip. And I know it was a very weird series for him coming in just after England have well, won the World Cup and he's not played much cricket since September. He, as Ben says, has not had a good series. But if you go back to the end of the 2019 World Cup, which is now over three years, Roy Ambridge is 23 in ODIs against full members. And sorry, with, across how many games? A twenty odd, at least right. twenty odd. He's played. He has played more than most of that English top seven. Um, even when he's, if he was in Nick, you'd still say that India probably wouldn't suit his game that much. And as I said, England only play twelve games before the World Cup. Well, that's confirmed at the moment. Um, they dropped him when there were ten games before the T Twenty World Cup. So I, I think England have a decision to make. And Phil, you asked a question towards the end of the T Twenty World Cup. Can you see Hales opening in India next year? I think that has become a lot more likely after this series. Yeah, I, I like Jason Roy a lot as a as a, as a cricketer, um, but the numbers are stark now. Uh, I feel I feel sorry for him in this instance, right? You, you imagine you you know you've played cricket, you know what it's like. That will be his preseason game equivalent. Mm. Yeah, he, he he hasn't picked up a bat for six weeks. Gloves won second ball in the second game. Yeah, yeah. That, exactly. Exactly. And you come up against, you know, a world-class pace attack. Um, so you're on a hide into nothing, really. It's implausible to think that you can go out there and, and start playing, especially the way that he plays when he mm. plays on the edge. So I do feel sorry for him. Uh, it was a tough assignment for him. Um, nonetheless, those numbers do stack up uh, in a negative way for him. Um, and as we've said before, when you do play like that, when you do have that almost unique way of going about it, then everything has to be working perfectly. And the game doesn't stop for anybody. And especially with English cricket as it is now, there are Jim Bunny beefcakes lining up, lined up around the block. And if it's not going to be Roy, then it will be Salt or it will be Smead or it will be 
uh, as you say, Alex Hales very much now will be in the conversation, and rightly so. So God knows who knows. Mm. We, we'll have to wait and see. J- James Vince is, is an interesting one as well. I mean, he really scra- crabbed around for 20 odd in 40 balls, got hit in the balls a couple of times. It, it didn't look much fun out there for him. Made a, a nice 60 odd in the second game. You tell me. I, I was in Spain this weekend, so I don't know. But uh, And then played, played a you know, inauspicious shot to give it away. England fell away in that second game. Uh, so there are narratives that creep into the series is even when they feel slightly irrelevant or even slightly slightly vulgar that they're even taking yeah, place. I think that second ODI was a massive missed opportunity for both Vince and Billings. England and not for two chasing two eighty odd. Yeah. Um they do really well to get not England back into the game, but actually they're probably favourites um with twenty odd overs to go. England properly collapse after Vince gets out. But you know, it's another what if moment for James Vince in Australia playing a ugly swipe when England only need five and a half and over and him and Billings are going so well at that point. They just didn't need to take the risks. Yeah. And then also for Billings, he's got a really good ODI record since the World Cup, but people kind of forget because ODI cricket's been played so inconsistently and Billings isn't always in the side. And with Morgan and Stokes gone, you could see a situation where Billings plays in the World Cup, but equally, this was a kind of opportunity. Like if one of those two guys gets a 130 like Milan did in the opening game, that's the kind of innings that you remember in six months' time, whereas yeah. two seventies in a defeat where you actually lose by a lot in the end, people will forget that. You know, actually remind me of um do you remember when Joe Denley played his first test series in the Caribbean in twenty nineteen? He got a seventy and I think there's a very long gap between that and England's next test, so there was a concern that no one's gonna remember that yeah, innings or, in six or- months' time. But you know, I think that might happen to these two guys here. Vince's last test match as well makes, mm. uh, what, 70-odd in New 76, Zealand? 76, yeah, in Christchurch. And, uh, uh, and then isn't picked again. I guess that w- one of the things with Hales as well, which complicates the decision for England, I think there was a sense ahead of the World Cup that he was kind of, apart from obviously the questions about uh, the, the you know the squad dynamic and that sort of thing, that he, he's kind of just a plug-and-play player, that he's played so much T20 cricket, he knows his game inside out. Uh, he's 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 cut, he's as close to a sure bet as you can get for a guy who hasn't played for England in three years. The question is is whether that the same is true in ODIs, considering that you know the last list A game he played was before the 2019 World Cup. Like, do will England because they there will be a temptation I think to back Roy even further because of the value he's brought them. Um, but will they actually look at something? Actually, if we are going to pick this guy, we are going to want him to have some time just building an innings in 50 over cricket. That is quite a big thing to ask someone to do first game in World Cup with three games left before a World Cup or something. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. Could, could, could I ask you, uh, what, does this, what we've seen in the last week, this video nasty, and it felt at certain points like England, it was almost like a dirty protest, right, by England. And in the context of Stokes having retired from it, in the context of there being next to nobody there at the grounds, in the context of this being the great old rivalry that's diminished here, the context of Australia playing broadly meaningless bilaterals over here in England and us returning the favour with a shrug of the shoulders. Uh, And it being well known that ODI cricket is the, you know, the Mrs. Rochester of the game, stuck in the back room, unwanted and slightly, you know, we're slightly embarrassed of it on a certain level. Does the last week tap into that, do you think? I mean, would Moeen have said that about any other format format of the game? Or or is this specific and unique to the fact that England have just made a bit of history and they're knackered and they want to mm. go home and we should just accept that? Uh, yeah, I, I think... No, there's a long question for you. I think it is especially weird because they've just won a World Cup. They have been meaningless on the surface ODI series for years between England and Australia. Uh, I think the players sometimes get an easy ride in the you know, you're 12 games away from the World Cup. Like exactly. this, this is quite an important game uh, as much as they, they might pretend otherwise. And actually, like from some of their shots in, in, in the second ODI, when Vince gets out, the middle order should still have shown more fight, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think they, the players probably do get an easy ride to a degree. They're still playing for England quite close to the World Cup. That should mean more than they gave off during this series. But it is also... Alarming for the format, isn't it? Yeah, it that, is. That, I mean, that these games, at the you know one of the grandest ga- grandest grounds of all time, where the whole game began, can be dismissed. Um, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, but I guess players have been making these noises about ODI cricket for a very long time. What, what Swan, when he was an active player, more than ten years ago, was saying he didn't like playing ODI yeah. cricket. So 
it's been there for a while. But yeah, I don't know. I, the World Cup will give ODI cricket a boost. I think we'll get into it. It'll be a really good tournament. Um, and I think it, ODI cricket will probably exist just around World Cups. And I think that's fine. Yeah, I guess the the, the, the funny thing as well is, that is what, why are these games are being played. It was talked about last week that... Uh, about Cricket Australia's relationship with their broadcasters and Channel 7 are, are, are suing Cricket Australia uh, at the moment, uh, which is uh, an interesting development. Um, but I guess if you, if you look sort of like at the broader picture of like how all these things kind of fit together, like you had this kind of, I don't know if it's a, a bubble exactly, you had the, like the, the growing uh, cost and value of rights deals, which meant that cricket governing bodies were keen to shove more in and broadcasts were keen to that as well, which is then players feel working them more and more and more and then you get to a stage where players are pulling out where international cricket is less good because of mm. how much of it you're playing and then these broadcasts in Australia are saying like hang on we are now not happy because these are less good than the stuff we paid for it's like well it's less good because of the <laughs> demands that you right. that you put on these players yeah. and, now, and now we get to this extreme thing where England are just like almost turning up like hung over essentially <laughs> Um, like really not not bothered. It's a complete farce of a series. It's their you know what the biggest ever ODI defeat in that last game, and no one cares. No one now thinks. Well, people, some people might think that Australia are a better ODI series than ODI team than England, but not based on, mm. on this series really. And it's been kind of as fast as you can as you can get. And this is the series that was supposed to you know make up for the fact that the other cricket had not been very good. Uh, so it's um it's all it is all a bit of a mess. And and sometimes players do get an easy ride but I mean in this case a World Cup win a week ago like I think you can be forgiven for being a bit like do I really have to right do I have to go again like like in other cases sure but but, but in, in this instance like even if there's just like a, like a, a, a 10 day gap or something uh like that would be something but like you, you're, you're literally into that they're in they're into pre sure. pre-series sure. media stuff yeah two days after having won a World Cup like that's yeah but but the, the the other side of that is that you hang around in Australia for another week you know waiting to begin a three three match series now you, we either think that that three match series in in and of itself has absolutely no validity and it needs to be scraped off the, the schedule or you play it as quickly as you can because the the worst of those evils is that you wait another 10 days until finally playing it when these players are desperate to get home. Um, uh, from a psychological perspective, I totally, totally see it. Right, you know, it's hard enough to get out of bed in the morning for anything. But if you've all, if you've achieved something that you've been dreaming about for a long, long time and made history, mm. as that that group have, then yeah, on a psychological yeah. level, it must be incredibly difficult to get yourself up again. Um, I guess they just probably shouldn't have picked the blokes who right. went to the World Cup. Right, you had, you had enough guys coming in who didn't play in the World Cup. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it was and, kind and of... perhaps. With Moeen and Butler, they should have perhaps said to you two, mm. you know, you've done so much anyway. You're such a key part, the heartbeat of the team and the identity of the team. And obviously captain and vice captain will move you along. And that would have been maybe a smart yeah. way Well, well And that's, that's the other thing about this this series is that, and even going beyond the guys who they, uh, who were already in Australia, there was, there was an element of just cost cutting with the squad they picked. I mean, why is Chris Jordan in the squad when he's not played an ODI in, in years? And they picked some, you know, some young fresh bowlers for that. Uh, Pakistan T20 series. Footprint. What say? Carbon footprint. Well, well yeah, yeah, yeah. But but then but then it is odd that like, what? Why do they not pick some of the the, the young bats that they liked? I guess some of them are in the the lines and the test squad as well. But like, what as a fact finding mission? What have England learned about James Vince that he can play some attractive half centuries and and, and get out at injudicious times? That Sam Billings is a is a, is a, is a, is, a, is a good player, but but again, is not, not something you can like completely rely on as a, as a world class middle order bat. Is the, mm. the, 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 you know, that Dow Man is capable of scoring big in Australian conditions. Like it's it's weird that these were the facts they chose to to find out in a way as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um a couple of things that I, I enjoyed in the series. Um so I liked that conventionally excellent bowling stood out. Uh there was a double wicket maiden from Stark at the sec at the start of the England innings in the second ODI, which is brilliant. The ball to Milan was basically perfect, mm. ninety mile per hour away swinger that hits the top of off. And also that Wokes played two games, but he clearly stood out among the England quicks. He went at about fives. Everyone else went at six or even sevens. And the Australia proper quicks all went at around about fives as well. So I like that everyone talks about how players like Smith, Coley, Root are better in ODI cricket. But it's also the bowlers as well. The, the really, the, the, the great bowlers do better and stand out more in ODI cricket than they do in, in T20s. Um, and then also 
Steve Smith claimed that he's in the best form um, he's been in for six years, which is potentially ominous. Um, he, uh, after hitting one cover drive in the series opener, he told David Warner, I'm back, baby, when he was in about 24. <laughs> um, which, given that he's averaged over 60 in test cricket in the last six years, um, mm. is quite interesting. I looked at how he's changed his stance over the years. He's the most side on he's really? been since 2013, and he's not moving. It's is as conventional as he's looked since he started playing test cricket, basically. He played one um, very odd looking shot today, mm-hmm. uh, sort of came down the track to Chris Wokes. He sort of saw him coming and bowled it really, really, really short. Like it was, he was a few yards out of his crease when he met the ball and it was still above his head. And he played some sort of forehand smash to mid on for a single. That's um, my boy. Yeah. Well, I guess, we, yeah, we should mention that Australia were quite good, I mm. suppose. And uh, Travis Head is an excellent ODI opener and he's showing that. Yeah. He's, he's it, probably an upgrade on Finch at the moment. It was almost, yeah. almost funny that uh, like the, the better they were, the funnier it was in a way from an England perspective because it was almost like it's a bit embarrassing you're trying this hard when this <laughs> when it does, don't you know this series doesn't count kind of thing but yeah and Australia uh, Warner his first 100 he, he'd gone longer with, without an international 100 than Virat Kohli had mm. um, and there were sort of some rumours around uh, his continued it's, it's a strange one where there's people saying he should be the next captain all saying like how much longer has he got left um, and I guess this will make the former possibly more likely and give him a bit more time in the side, I suppose. At I least. have to say, but I wasn't listening to the first bit of your point, but then got <laughs> that you were talking about Warner and the possibility of him becoming captain and then started listening. Yes. <laughs> now, obviously, yeah, correct me, this will need to be edited. <laughs> um, where's the... St- have they overturned the lifetime ban or is that on the table for CA? Uh, I think or, he's appealing it. So I he think, said uh, this week that he is not a criminal um, in, in defence. Uh, that, that, that he shouldn't be banned for life. And so I, think I think what think they've overturned appealed. is that they've given him the ability to appeal it, I think. Right. So that's that's what's changed. Um, I'm an innocent man. <laughs> yeah. a um, man yeah. Dan Senior, who's our video editor and appeared on a couple of pods during the World Cup, made the excellent point this morning that England have an appalling record in games played on BT Sport. So they got thumped this series, lost right. in the West Indies, both Test and T20Is. And then lost both BT Ashes series. Maybe, yeah. Has it been two or three BT Ashes series? But they've lost at least the last two anyway. It's a really good point. And, so, Matt, and Matt Smith, who presents it. He's got a horrible record. Yeah, horrible Matt, record. Matt, Matt Smith's a really good good presenter, a stalwart of the game. But he's got this un, uh, unshakable sense of melancholy because he works through the night <laughs> witnessing misery <laughs> and having to convey it to a, to a British UK audience. And he's got to perk up the, 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 the talent as well. You've got to keep yeah. Pri- Pryor and Harmison. Yeah cheerful and, and the thing um, with cricket you, you have to acknowledge that a lot of the time it's a shit show and no one really wants to be there and it's really awkward but of course the fact that you pay a load of money to get the rights <laughs> confers some sort of optimism onto it and big steve harmison and, and matt Pryor alongside you know the long-suffering matt mm. smith this morning I, I felt for them for them all you know yeah, that they are shilling hard for that dollar and, and also, I feel like Matt Smith is really good at kind of encouraging you to keep going. He's like, yeah, come on. We, we know it's difficult, yeah. but keep going. Yeah. Keep going. And it, and it happened after an hour, hour and a bit of Brisbane on, in late <laughs> November, you know, when, when Rory Burns walked round one and you could already feel it, but he thought to himself, I've got two and a half months of nocturnal <laughs> grimness ahead of me. And so yeah. have you folks. Yeah. Um, I, guess, in tomorrow. I guess that's what happens if, if England dare to play away from Sky. Um, a question on the <laughs> T20 World Cup win, because why not? This is from Ed. Hi, Yaz, Phil and Ben. Hi, Ed. Firstly, thank you so much for your podcast. I've been listening every week for about three years now, and it's one of the high points of my week. It's a very nice thing to say. I wanted to ask one thing I noticed during the T20 World Cup. I'm a big England fan and watched all of their games, and maybe maybe my memory is getting hazy, but it did seem like that whenever Chris Jordan wasn't in the 11, he ended up fielding at one stage or another in the match. Occasionally, this was due to injury sustained during the game, but more often than not, it was due to someone having some kind of breather from an outsider's perspective, at least. Do you think this is a genuine tactic that England used to give Jordan, given that Jordan is one of the best fielders in the world? I know he was the next man into 11 when Wood was injured, but it did seem to give England an advantage given all his catches in the tournament as a substitute to, fielder. To, okay, to paraphrase Duncan Fletcher to Ricky Ponting, if you want to cloth one up to the greatest hands that English cricket has ever seen at long on, <laughs> then whose fault is that when he's talking about Gary Pratt? Uh, look. He, he asked, are there laws which prevent this from happening and should they be stricter? It seems unfair that England were getting the bowling of Jordan and the fielding, no, sorry, the bowling of Wood and the fielding of Jordan at the same time. Not a huge issue in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and I know that you like to deliberate over the fine deep details of <laughs> T20 cricket. 
So um, I mean, all the best and thanks again for all your hard work. Th- there are some laws, right, to prevent this in that if, you, if you're off the field without an external injury for a certain amount of time, you can't bowl for that same amount of time or you can't bat if it's un- until you've been on the field for, if that makes sense, for the differential. So there are laws there. And also it's... It's, I mean, it's different to the Gary Pratt thing because Chris Jordan is a very good T20 cricketer. He's just not quite in England's best 11. So he's not in that squad just because of his fielding. I mean, that definitely adds value, as does his presence around the group and his his leadership and that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, but he also came in in the semi-final and, and bowled very well. And, and, so, and I mean... Like it, it, he's definitely the twelfth man, though, isn't he? In, <laughs> in a squad of fifteen or sixteen. Yeah, sure. He's always the twelfth. But but I, I, I mean, I don't think that, that there are laws I'm all there. For it, by the way, yeah, that there, there are laws there to 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 stop teams from taking undue advantage of this. And I suppose within that, England probably pushed it to the limit. And I don't really mind because I quite like watching good mm. fielders. Uh, do good things. I think that's quite a nice thing to watch in cricket, mm. I suppose. <laughs> um, what a lovely point. Falak asks one of the great questions. Hi guys, great show as always. Being a late cricket lover since 2019, I've slowly got to grips with the game. I won't bore you, but I have a question relating to one of my favourite players, Adil Rashid. Now, I know he's a great bowler, great player, etc. But one thing that always amuses me is the fact, brackets, myth, question mark, that he's a great batter. The only tail ender runs I love to see is if it's an English player in an international game. I hate it when it happens against us. What made me laugh was in the Pakistan series, I saw that Rashid's stats that he'd scored about 80 runs in about 80 matches for England in T20 cricket. But every time he is mentioned in commentary in a batting sense or comes out to bat, the stat that has to be mentioned is that he's got 10 first class centuries. Now, being a late cricket addict, Rashid's test years elude me. I've tried searching on YouTube for his highlights or any footage at all, but can anyone actually confirm that this is true? And if so, what type of innings did he play? P.S. Can Mark pass on a message to Jimmy Anderson when he next sees him to just spend a little bit more time in the nets to improve his batting? Now that Trent Bolt is stepping away from international cricket, Jimmy needs to take full advantage by making sure he retakes the spot for being the greatest number 11 in test history. And we'll make sure that Mark passes that message on to Jimmy when he next sees him. But on, on Rashid, that's a great question. And I was looking through Rashid's old numbers. Um, first, we've got to remember that Rashid's really quite old. He's, he's 34. He first played for England in 2009. He's 27 year old on his birthday. He made his T20I debut alongside James Foster, Owen Morgan, and Rob Key. So he's obviously been around for a while. In the 2009 County Championship, Rashid averaged 68 with the bat. And in the England side that played the second ODI against Australia. It was quite funny looking down the number of first class hundreds through the batting lineup. So Jason Roy opening up with Phil Salt, nine and four respectively. Davin Milan and Vince, you know, proper batters, 28 and 27. Billings, six. Moeen, 20. Wokes, 10. Sam Curran at number eight, one. Liam Dawson at number nine, 11. David Willey at number 10, two. And then Adil Rashid with 10 at number 11. Um, so and you guys got anything more to add? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I saw him get a hundred, uh, once. Uh, so yeah, I can confirm that did happen. He also made a really good 60 odd trying to save a game. Was it against Pakistan? Yeah. Yeah. And the then, the series. and yeah. then he just got away from him and he chipped one to cover mm. in the end. I think they might've lost that game in the end, but back for the best part of the afternoon. Um, yeah. And right early on, he came into that England side when he was a kid, uh, and played a couple of interesting knocks, a couple of 30-odds, very, you know, very inventive, wristy, sort of early prototype white ball knocks. Well, Ben made the point when Shall this email... Yeah, yeah. Came, yeah, go for it, go <laughs> <Yeah>. for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he, he played an innings which was quietly really crucial in England's white ball revolution. The first game of the proper uh, sort of rebirth, so not including the Ireland one after that World Cup. Uh, England are, what, 200 for six when Rashid comes in to join Butler, they could very easily at that point be 250 all out. Uh, people are asking... Or 280 for nine. Yes, yeah, exactly. P- p- if, if, and people either are saying, well done for them for, you know, recalibrating or why did England go so hard that they understand they can't play the way the likes of New Zealand, Australia do, etc. Instead, Rashid makes a quick 60 odd, Butler gets 100. Uh, England make 400 for the first time in their history. Uh, they win the game. That is then one of the great ODI series uh, and everything flows from there. I mean, maybe they would have had the the, the stomach to stick with it if uh, if that doesn't happen, if that series, they do get beaten 5-0, whatever might have happened. 
but uh, there's no way of knowing and that did just just did perfectly tear up and Rashid was crucial to it and that can be forgotten I think mm. well there we go not anymore <laughs> great, <laughs> great question and well answered Ben uh, next what up- about my bit I didn't really and Phil, yeah. Um, really <laughs> Next up, a bit. I remember the hundred that you want, that I, I saw though. One hundred and fifty <laughs> against Lancashire. Okay, okay. Um, that moving, definitely happened. Moving on. Uh, next up, a bit more on England's tour of Pakistan. So England are currently in the UAE alongside the England Lions. They play a three-day game that starts tomorrow before flying to Pakistan. So a good opportunity for a few Lions players to impress there. Ollie Pope will be captaining the full England side, Whoa. Um, which is which is exciting. That is huge. Um, Pakistan have named a squad for the series. There is no Shaheen Afridi who is out with injury, which is obviously a massive shame. Harris Ralph and Mohammed Wasim, who have played 15 first-class games between them, are both in the squad. They've got a Muhammad Ali, a 30-year-old uncapped medium pacer with just 22 first-class games to his name in the squad. Abra Ahmed, a 24-year-old bespeckled leggy who's taken loads of wickets this season in a Kadi Azam trophy, the Pakistan first class. Pakistan first class How old did you say he was? 24. Okay. Um, I've watched, there's a video, the Pakistan coverage of the domestic competition there is, is really excellent. We love to say how great our streams are but the quality of their highlights mm. blow everything that we have in England out of the water. Um, and there's a video of all 43 wickets he's taken this season. Loads of googlies. The vast, vast, vast majority of his wickets are googlies. He attacked the stumps. Um, what I would say is the highlights reel isn't actually that exciting for a leg spinner taking loads of wickets, but you can see a young leggy causing England lots of problems. And I think there's a pretty good chance he plays. Fawad Alam, Yassir Shah and Hassan Ali are all dropped. Um, and I was kind of trying to work out what the Pakistan side is going to look like. And I've got Imam and Abdullah Shafiq at the top. Azhar Ali or Sean Massoud at three. I reckon Sean Massoud. Yeah, you I reckon? Think I think, nod. yeah. Azhar Ali was dropped for the last test match, right? Yeah, Against they Australia. played quite a weird basketball like, with Rizwan at four. So it's it's hard. And Fawad Alam, who is not in this squad, did play in that game. So it's mm. a bit hard to tell how they reject, but yeah. And then you've got Baba and Rizwan will definitely play a batter at six. Probably... A guy called Sword Shaquille, who's not played for Pakistan yet, but averages 50 in first-class cricket and even more than that in the last couple of years. Uh, probably an all-rounder at seven. Um, Mohammed Nawaz or Fahim Ashraf. Nawaz has played recently. Naseem Shah, you'll think, will play. And there'll be a spinner, either Abra Ahmed or uh, Norman Ali, likely, uh, the 36-year-old mm. left-arm spinner. And then two of those other quicks who have barely played first-class cricket, let alone test cricket. However... Harris Rouse, a special talent, and without Shaheen in the squad, yeah, poor kid. Uh, Harris Rouse has definitely got the components to to make to make an impact here and there in in Test cricket. Um, just on 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 now Manali, as you say, sort of thirty something left arm spinner went okay against Australia, but didn't do didn't do great. And knowing the way that they like to attack a new series, especially against the English. I can well see that 24-year-old googly bowler mm. coming into the side. I've seen that footage as well on online. And there's a few iffy shots and uh, and a few beauties in there as well. He just bowls straight. It's quite simple, yeah, right? Yeah, there's a, there's a sort of a gentlemendous kind of element mm. to what's going on there a little bit. Loads well, of LBWs. One, one side point on it, though. Boring point, actually, now I think about it. But... Um, England or Australia or whoever, New Zealand used to turn up in the subcontinent and there would be this sort of mysterious figure emerge out of the ether and he'd take 25 wickets in three tests. Uh, but now, all of these names, they'll be able to call up information on them straight away and we can see it straight away. And so this boy won't be a mystery in, in a week or two's mm. time, even if he does get the nod. Um, and so some of that, magical strangeness, magical realism. I don't know. Doesn't make any sense. Moving into a series uh, such as this is removed from it. I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing, but it's just different. And even thinking back to, say, the Dubai weirdness against Pakistan maybe 10, 15 years ago or so when England got... 2012. Yeah. 2012, yeah. And Morgan was still a test player and was getting stuffed and so on. And it was the left arm spinner, wasn't it? The one who got done for smoking dope. Yeah, Abdul Rahman. Rahman. Thank you. Thank you. And although you'd heard about him a little bit, mm. and he later played a little bit for Somerset, I believe, and so on. But at the time, England, England were just looking around, who is this kid? And that's only 10 years ago, mm. you know. But now, such is the data revolution in the game that there are no mysteries anymore. Yeah. I think, um, I think though, just looking at the squad, 
<sighs> Sorry, I've, I've, one, one name I forgot to mention. Uh, so Faraz Ahmed's back. Um, so yeah, he's back in the squad. So he, he might play. Mm. But he won't, right? If 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 most if Rizwan's yeah, I guess someone's got a bat six, so you, you could you could he end could up. Do play, that. He, he, he could play ahead of um, Shaquille, the on cap guy. Listen, that's a really good shout because mm. he's he's got a good record against England. You know, okay, he might be getting on a bit, but he can play. Definitely I mean, played forty nine test matches, average thirty six, three hundreds. Right. Obviously, can bat. That's a great shout in the mm. middle order. But, but Pakistan are definitely still favourites for this series. But England will be looking. They'll. But England will be looking at this squad and thinking that there's there should be a path to 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 winning the series. Basically, like like when you look at that attack. Uh, I mean, what Nazim Shah is the most experienced, quick in the or experienced bowler that they've picked, especially yeah, bowler, he is, and he's he is, and he's yeah. 19 years old. Uh, as you say, Harrison was seen 15 games between them. Obviously. Both very exciting, very talented, very and can, can bowl very quickly. But you do get some flat wickets, and if England are just able to put up a big score, they will think that these guys are going to be bowling longer than they ever have in their careers. Uh, how quick is Harris Ralph going to be in his fifth spell? In the you know, it's not going to be as hot as it sometimes is, but it's still going to be pr- pretty warm at times. Um, and then yeah, and then a, a batting lineup with a few holes in it as well. I mean. It could be a sort of a maybe a 500 place 400 kind of series. I mean, Pakistan will back themselves to get big runs. Abdul Shafiq mm. has been brilliant so far. Imam Wahak kind of came of age a bit in that Australia series, and Ian and Babar Azam and Rizwan are both brilliant, as we know. But I think Eng- England should at least be looking at that, thinking that if we just, I mean, it's not a very England way to do it, at least this New England side, but they, sh- they, they should, they might, maybe they should be thinking if we bat long, then the rewards will come. Uh, whether they do that or they think let's just go and try and smash these guys out of the attack, I think that will benefit the likes of Ralph, Nazim Shah, because mm. uh, that's kind of what they're they're used to in a way. You know, they're used to guys coming at them swinging. Mm. Them. Let's do it next week. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, but this this is squad this week, you know. So. Yeah, no, no I, I know, darling. I'm only kidding. Yeah, Good I stuff. mean, I, I had the same impression as as Phil. Really, he'd looked at that list of players and actually worked out what the eleven's going to look like. That's not it's not that good. And but Pakistan's recent record isn't that good either. They played two series. In the last year, only two series, uh, they lost at home against Australia uh, and then drew away to Chris Ilwood's Tranker. So their recent record isn't that good. They're not Is playing that right? Frank record. Lampard's Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah trying okay. to get that going. Yeah, okay, um, nice. I like that. Um, and, and no, Yazid Shah, I mean, England fans might be a bit puzzled by that because he has an absolutely brilliant record against England. But it's kind of been coming for a while and he has been, he's been dropped before and then come back and that sort of thing. He he, he is fit though, isn't he? Yeah, yeah he's and he, he's, he's actually had a decent first class mm. season. Um, but I guess, I mean, th- those those returns have been on the decline for yeah, for a while. Sure. And, uh, yeah, that, and, it, and I guess happened, the other, other, other injury one is Hassan Ali, who in 2021 had an outstanding year in test cricket. He's basically had four bad test matches and he's been dropped. And even with Shaheen out, they've still decided to leave him out of the squad, let alone the 11th squad, which I think is quite a bold call when they are going to have to play, I think they're going to have to give at least one, maybe two debuts to, to, to a scene bowler, unless there's someone I'm missing in the squad or they go particularly spin heavy. Mm. So that that's quite a quite a big call. I thought um, I thought Muhammad Ali looks all right from the highlights though. I mean yeah. not not in a not he's not in the same mould as uh, Nazim and uh, um and and Ralph. Uh, Dan Dan Senior, another mention for him, he sort of said he instantly he just looks like Ollie Robinson. Uh, and there did look to be quite a lot of that kind of skillful winking out of batters I don't think mm. he'll go for many um and yeah I, I could easily sit I mean England could well that they'll look at the attack and think we could be making 550 here and really putting some miles in these legs they could also easily be skittled by a googly bowl they don't really know much about and uh uh sort of clothing at the future covers off a, off a medium pace they underestimate so yeah and, and also Pakistan you, you talk about mystery spinners in the past doing well Pakistan also do have a pretty good record of um 80 mile per hour seam it was called Muhammad A Doing well, <laughs> bowling at about seventy-five to eighty miles per hour. What's happened to the original Mohammed or one of the original Mohammed? Um, I'm not sure if Mohammed Asif is is no, available for this no, series. No, Mohammed Abbas. <laughs> uh, that's a good question, actually, and I don't know the answer. Mohammed Asif was playing in Norway last time I heard. Re- okay, as in the Mohammed Asif, yeah, the, the the genius with the the juicy past. Yeah, um, uh, he was playing in Norway. But anyway. yeah, Abbas hasn't played you know 90, 90 Test wickets at twenty three. He's not played a Test match for. Uh, well over a year is now. Is that squad for the full series or just for the first test? It is for the full series. Right, interesting. Um, next up, England women have a new head coach. 
Paul asks, I can't ask a question about the ODI series because I don't care about it, but I would <laughs> like to hear your thoughts on the appointment of John Lewis as the new England women's head coach. I recognise his face, but I don't know anything about him. So this is my moment of the week, by the way. So the Telegraph's headline when Lewis got the role was exclusive. John Lewis beats John Lewis to become head coach of England women. Both Johns spell their name without an H. Uh, John Lewis, the former England and Gloucestershire, Seema pipped John Lewis, the former Essex and Durham batter, to the job. Uh, it's quite funny imagining conversations at the ECB discussing which one to appoint um, with those two as the, as the two front runners. You know, who knows? They, they might have appointed the wrong one. Um, but Ben, what do you make of the appointment? What's in his in tray? What should we expect from this John Lewis? Well, of the appointment, in a way, it's almost like an old style uh, pre key uh, appointment of a, a, a coach who's come up through the pathways, has kind of earned his stripes. Uh, and and this is now a another promotion along the rung, I guess. Um, anyway, England fast bowling coach for a while. Uh, obviously, did some stuff at Sussex with the Young Lions, that sort of thing. Um, so th- there's not been, you know, he's not been a huge media presence, and there's not uh, sort of a glut of things out there saying that you know he's, you know, the the, the definitive John Lewis story, I guess. I think so. Joffrey Archer spoke pretty glowingly of him when he was at Sussex, uh, and his and the work he's done with him. I suppose the most notable thing he's done. Uh, as th- that's got publicity, I guess, is after the Ashes, uh, the the men's Ashes last year, when Ollie Robinson was was bowling well but struggling with fitness, and he sort of came out and gave him like a pretty uh, public blast, I guess. To, I think it was to the broadcast at the end of the day, um, and people at the time were sort of saying like, "Is that the right way to go about it? Is that what you know Robinson needs?" Uh, obviously, had a tough first year in in lots of ways. Um, is that the thing that's going to get him? going again or is this just kind of throwing a guy under the bus when your bowlers are struggling and then in the end Robinson has come back you know better than ever this summer and has said that that's exactly what he needed so that that is a tick in the box in terms of his management style and I suppose also the England women's dressing room has at times been possibly too cozy a place in terms of uh, uh, players allowed to sort of stick around producing not great returns but just uh, still sort of get, getting picked and that sort of thing and if you know I don't think he's going to come in and sort of knock heads together but mm. it also shows that he's not he's not exactly a continuity selection I suppose the other interesting thing is just that he is a man I mean I remember when uh uh when Lisa Cartley got appointed Phil you you wrote and said on the podcast that that might be the 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 last you know uh that Mark Rons might be the last ever man who was uh England women's head coach that's obviously now not the case um, I suppose there's a few high profile names who rule themselves out Charlotte Edwards um and is it she- Shelley Nitschke from uh from Australia she did as well uh but still perhaps there's something in the in the pathway that the ECB will be hoping that they can have more homegrown women coaches I know that what Danny Hazel is pretty highly thought of and that sort of thing um but yeah so and then what's in his intray I mean there's a a West Indies series that they still announce a squad for but they leave for pretty soon um it starts in two weeks yeah but there's uh, and it seems like Siva and Knight will be back for that which is a massive boost and then the World Cup next I mean it's a really it's a of a brutal start with the World Cup next year. At least England have a slightly easier group in that and the Ashes after that. Um, but yeah, he's got a few things for it. I mean, England do have quite a lot of young seamers and actually I guess that could also point to his uh, appointment mm. is that if England are going to make the leap from being a good to a great side, they do have some, they have quite a lot of battery they can kind of rely on at this point. You know, Dunkley coming of age, uh, Bowman, Lisa, and ODI still being as good as, as, as she has been. Uh, Siver and Knight, also two brilliant players. But the seamers are where there is that transition. And if you could have someone to put an arm around the shoulders of the likes of, uh, uh, of, of Freya Davies and, uh, and, and, and other people who are coming up, um, that's where Lewis could really sort of earn, earn his corn, I suppose. So that, that would be the main thing I think is, um, having that young group of seamers coming in and really establishing themselves as uh, proper forces to be reckoned with as they move away from the, the brunt shrub salt era. Mm. Yeah. All fair. All, all pretty much bang on actually just, one thing, it is a, continu- a continuity appointment in one respect because he's in the system. Just like J.J. Lewis, the other John Lewis was as well. Uh, but the fact that he is a bowling specialist and that that is the area where there's probably a bit more scope for a, for advancement among certain young players, that may just have swung it. But I know, not that I know him personally at all, but I know that he's very well respected and that he's, he's, he's done good graft with the... With the men's team, um, and I, I, I like the fact actually that 
it feels now there is a more positive vibe around English cricket and at that level and that Key's doing good things on the men's side of things and that Claire obviously is you know is 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 the the, the boss of the women's stuff even though she's not as hands on as she used to be I like I like the fact that they are kind of crossing over a little bit more mm-hmm. and sharing expertise and sharing ideas um I may well have written that thing that Ben said I don't remember writing that um I, I in perhaps in sort of counterintuitively it's quite a good thing that it's that it's a bloke because they've just they've they've gone back to the best person for the job at the time they it's not been a tokenistic appointment you know and that Lisa Kiteley was the best person for the job at that point and they now feel that this person is the best job person for the job at this point and that the gender of the next person after John Lewis might be John Lewis <laughs> uh is needn't be the needn't be the be all and end all you mm-hmm. know um uh, so, you know, there's a sort of co- coherence and a cohesiveness to that appointment, which I quite like. Mm. Um, elsewhere in the women's game, former Ireland quick Kim Garth has been called up for Australia for their series against India. Garth moved to Australia two years ago and became eligible for Australia this September. I guess it's quite special for Ireland to have produced a player who's now deemed good enough for the best team in the world. There's also an Australia, first Australia call up for teenager Phoebe Litchfield, who's had a very good WBBL and whose name has been around for a while ever since a video of her netting a few years ago went viral. I think we mentioned that a few times in the pod, but do look that up if you can. It is pretty cool. Um, ben, India played New Zealand in a T20i series this week that was arguably even more pointless than the England-Australia ODI series. Anything interesting happen? Uh, yeah, well, it's actually my moment of the week as um, <laughs> Surik and Muyad have made, uh, made another 100 in the second game. Obviously, we know He's brilliant, but this was just another demonstration of of his of, of how excellent he is. I mean, uh, in the, the rest of the game, I think New Zealand made one twenty. The other India batters made sixty eight, about a run a ball between them, and then he blitzes one hundred and eleven or fifty one. Uh, I mean, we, we know he's amazing, uh, and we've done this the story. I think it's still worth. I mean, this year that he's had in T Twenty I cricket. I mean, he will probably never match again and probably no one will ever match again. Because even if you look at his IPL numbers, which are very, very good, he was sort of averaging like mid 40, striking at like 145, 150. Whereas this year he's averaging like 45, striking at near to 190. It's absolutely ridiculous. That There's one shot he plays that I actually can't think I've seen another batter play, which is a, uh, it's, and it's, it's, it's quite hard. It's quite niche. It's quite hard to describe. But it's, it's off the, over third man. Yeah. Right. Off the front foot to balls that aren't that wide. Obviously you've had players sort of play like skies over third man to sort of wide full balls. And you've obviously had the uppercut played deliberately over third man. But this is a shot that is kind of like, he, he and he kind of just seems to do it for fun. Or I guess when they plug the cover gap, like they could, he could just hit it over cover, but he kind of twists his hands at the last minute. His bat ends up so that the the back of the blade is facing back down the ground. It goes miles over third man. He did that in this innings again after he got to his 100. Um, yeah, he's, a, he's a, completely, a completely brilliant player. I suppose what's interesting from this series is uh, that... It comes in the light of India having sacked their selection committee in aftermath of the T20 World Cup and looking to appoint a new group. And that does leave some players sort of looking around nervously, I guess. I mean, they obviously a lot of big personalities, big names in the India team, and you can question to what extent they actually justify their place in the side. And that goes for, you know, Kara Hall, who at one point you mm. would have said was up there with the best T20 bats in the world, but has really struggled in the last few years. Rohit Sharma has for a long time not been that good in T20 cricket. I think it's six years since he averaged 30 in an IPL season or struck at uh, more than 135. So he, he is just, it's hard to justify that he is a, that caliber of, of T20 player really. And obviously we've sung Sky's praise and he is a freak in some senses and then you don't have another player as good as him. But they do have players in that profile. I mean, we've talked about pretty Shaw sure before, but Sanji Sampson was in this squad, but wasn't, picked for any of the games and he, and he has uh, that kind of dynamism that could really transform that indie middle order if they're keen to go with that so that'll be and I guess how that balances with Rahul Dravid who's not had a good time of it as India coach so far so uh, yeah I mean again you didn't di- didn't learn a huge amount India won the one game that was played to a conclusion then there was a, a washed out tie in the third game and a washed out no result in the first game uh, but yeah some, some, some things to, mm. to flag as well and Siraj as well who's um a very likable cricketer who's uh, come in and out of the side, had a very good series, took four for 17 in the last game. Um, so that's good to see. Nice. Um, elsewhere in the international game this week, 
Nicholas Puran has resigned as West Indies limited overs mm. captain after West Indies uh, really quite bad T20 World Cup. Uh, English batter Laurie Evans has tested positive for trace amounts of a banned substance. In a statement, Evans said, I believe passionately in clean sport and I've never taken any banned substances. I do not know what caused a positive test, but my team and I are investigating how this could have happened and I'm doing everything possible to find out. Due to the confidentiality of this process, I cannot say any more at this stage. He will not play in the BBL as originally planned. The, and, this this BBL, by the way, I think it could be a, an all timer of a, of a of a rubbish tournament. Possibly. It's on BT. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you've got an Australia public. He's already had, you know, been up to his eyeballs in T20 cricket with the World Cup. Uh, barely attended that. I know that it's at different times and that sort of thing. But you've had what? So Liam Livingston, top draft pick, has pulled out. David Willey, one of the top draft picks, has also pulled out. You've got Laurie Evans, who was a, a, a high value player, also pulled out. Uh, they're going to struggle to replace these players considering the other more lucrative tournaments mm. that are going on at the same time in uh, the UAE and South Africa. Zach Crawley's think, in. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I think it's going to be, yeah, they can discover Zach Crawley. They like, they like discovering players that we've known about for ages in Australia. <laughs> but yeah, there's going to be a dearth of star names, uh, possibly less interest. And I think, I mean, I imagine it's longer than ever. Mm. So this one could really, really drag on. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk about it on the podcast. Anyway. And... In India this week, Narayan Jagadeesan broke the record for the highest ever score in a list A game. He scored 277, um, which was his fifth hundred in his many games. So spare a thought for oh. Ali so spare a thought for Ali Brown, who's two six eight back back in two thousand two for Surrey against Glamorgan is is knocked off top spot. Um, so, so hold on, this this lad has made five list A hundreds in a row. Yeah, that's yeah. also a world record, yeah. Yeah. And the final one is an all-timer. I mean, yeah. no, we know it's the final one yet. He's, uh, yeah. he's got two, <laughs> right, uh, so it's 277 off 141 balls, uh, 25 falls, 15 sixes, so striking 196. And the name again? Tamil Nadu, uh, Narayan Jagadeesan. So he's, he's not actually that young. He's played in the IPL for CSK, I think, but he's not a regular. I think he will be this year. Um, <laughs> he's in good nick. Tamil Nadu scored 506 for two off their 50. Another record. And then they bowled out... Um, Arun Kal Pradesh for 71. So they won by 435 runs. So if you think England have had a bad week in ODI cricket, not as bad Is that as Arun Kal The Pradesh. first time 500 has been breached? In a men's, in a men's. In a men's 50 over yeah. game? So all, all the records there. Wow. Um, and then our second great question. This is a long one, but bear with us because I think this is really, really excellent and very thoughtful. This is from James and the subject title was The Problem with Red and White. I'm talking about cricket rather than that team down Gillespie Road, although they are also a problem, as I'm sure Phil would agree. No, He, he had me at that. <laughs> no, I'm thinking about Jonathan Liu's piece about how cricket is now two sports and Will Smead's retirement from first-class cricket at the age of 21. Is it just two sports? First class, 50 over, T20, the 100 and club cricket all seem quite different beasts to me. At what point do the ECB and the counties consider a, f a more formal administrative split between red and white ball cricket? The current domestic situation hampers both forms of the game. We slice up the first class season in ever weirder ways to make room for the white ball game while torturing the white ball game with a fixture frenzy that leaves anyone except the hardcore fans struggling to keep up. Let's for one moment forget about the players and think about the tournaments. Sporting contests are over pretty quickly. A title fight can last for fewer than five minutes, but people still pay for it. It's the anticipation that makes something special. No broadcaster can ever talk about the current contest without talking about the build-up to the Ashes or the World Cup, even if I wish that sometimes they wouldn't. There's no time to anticipate or digest the domestic white ball game. In fact, there's no rhythm or meter to any of the white ball competitions. There's not much for the Red Bull either. How many people did you hear complain about the county season being interrupted so many times this year? No other major domestic sport attempts to do this. It's easy to compare to the Premier League, but you don't get this sort of thing in rugby or rugby league or hockey or ice hockey or American football or the AFL or even club cricket. Al Pacino would have to start in any given Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday if, he's been, very play good. if he's been playing Peter Moore. That Moore's. is very good. It's ironic because cricket is the exemplar of the long, slow build-up, on the field at least, the five-day crescendo of a close test match, or 2019 at Lords, or last week at the MCG. Football gets that maybe half an hour of tension in 90 minutes. We get hours and days. 
But what is the Premier League except a long, slow series of anticipations and climaxes, or builds and drops, as Darth Punk might call them? Cricket seems... You, you said that like my dad would. <laughs> <laughs> Cricket seems to have forgotten this because the administrators, the administrators are endlessly trying to carve up the season, either destroying the narrative mid-season or forcing people to binge whether they want to or not. We know why. You only need to look at Shaheen Afridi's right knee or Ben Stokes' left one or Mark Wood's elbow or Joffre Archer's back. That's why we can only forget about the players for a moment. But perhaps we've all been kidding ourselves. No one can serve two masters. If the domestic game is in a bad way, then it's because it's being pulled in two directions and the players need to decide which one they're heading to. Wouldn't it be better to start the T20s or the 100 in April and finish in October? From Saturday the 1st of April 2023, the 28th of October 2023, there are 31 Saturdays. Why should cricket end when term starts? With a few midweek games and breaks for other things, we could easily get an 18-team league into that period. Given that where we are, perhaps a season of two halves would be a compromise. Start with a larger county blast season from April to July and then move it to the more elite 100 from August to September play the championship in parallel to both competitions maybe there are sound financial reasons why this isn't possible but i bet we could make it work with more fixtures could there even be more tv revenue and even more importantly a weekly domestic free-to-air ter- ter- terrestrial tv highlight show the thing that has to give is the ability for most players to routinely play both formats some could play cameos but this ch- this choice is pretty much happening already as smead and billings have shown in the last couple of weeks There are more questions about how we arrange club cricket, and I think there's a very strong case of reforming that too. Why do most clubs focus almost entirely on 50 over or time cricket and play very little T20 cricket? Why do so few players get the chance to play double innings games? Um, But let's not get into that now. Anyway, that's all I've got at the moment. Have a great break. The World Cup shows were great, by the way. Um, Thanks. That's an awesome email. You can always get in touch with us at podcast at wisdom.com but, and don't be intimidated by the quality of <laughs> yeah. that still do writing folks um that there's there's so much in that but phil do you want to do you want to start <laughs> uh i think it should just stand alone i think it's just just stand alone as a thought-provoking mm. mini essay really um it, it would be a bit churlish to to try and pithily break that mm. down it's basically uh, uh, an entire uh, show's worth of indeed, ideas. Indeed, and that's it. And and more of that, please. Uh, there is something very appealing. If we were starting from scratch with a blank slate, there is something very appealing about the idea of uh, a 34-game season of a form, a, a mixture of T20 and 50-over mm. cricket to be played as he says, across weekends predominantly, but with the odd midweeker here and there, to get those 34 games in across an 18-club league. There's something beautiful about that. Uh, Are we pro-October 28th cricket? No, (laughs) no. But seeing as as we're in such a mess anyway, we can be pro the end of September. And and we were playing cricket at the start of October a year or so ago. The problem, I guess, is that's your finale. And that may be at the behest of the weather and all of that. But there's something very appealing and beautiful about that idea and very interesting. And I've never read it anywhere else. Mm. The problem is um, you've got a blank piece of paper over here and then you've got a Jackson Pollock painting, which is English English cricket over there. So how you begin to scrub away to get to a point where you could actually make this work is, is for, for brains well beyond mine. Mm. Um, there is the other thing... That, the more immediate point, and I haven't read John's, John Lou's piece, I haven't read that, um, but no doubt it will be brilliant and thought provoking as everything is that he does. But I don't see the game being, the, the, the game diverging that much, especially not the English game, in part because of economic reasons. Uh, counties don't have the money to pay large numbers of white ball only cricketers and keep them in gainful employment and also pay a large number of red ball cricketers. And our culture is so wedded to those two forms and red ball cricket in England, at least isn't going anywhere. So I, counties don't have the ability to ape say Surrey and have increasingly two different pots of players. Mm. We already have a very bloated game, arguably with 400 and something professional players. So Still, I think the reality is in many, many cases that these players double up 
these players do both and the good players do it do both competently and the really good players do both very well and the really 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 special players they get to choose but they are still pretty f- a few and mm. far between I think and bidding this media in the day deal Right, yeah. So, so you know, uh, Wayne Madsen to me is more indicative of county batting than Will Smead, mm. and will and will continue to be five years from now, seven years, ten years from now. Mm. Um, but there's plenty more yeah, in that email yeah. that I haven't even begun to go near. I just think people just need to, you know, <laughs> listeners can just pick it apart themselves because yeah. I certainly can't. It's your birthday, man. You bought four Guinnesses. It is. I'm it waiting is. to get to get done here. Um, well, you've you got control over how long we have to get to that point because the only thing left on the show phil is your moment of the week oh yeah okay i will be brief but i did have we should and crack open a can of guinness for this one i think yeah no, no 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 because I'm, I'm not going to give that much away but you can crack crack one open um so i was uh i was heading to gatwick airport on friday morning and joe root was heading to heathrow um i was thank you guinness i was riding my thumb uh and Joe was being driven, of course, down from, from Sheffield down into London. But uh, he was heading off to the UAE and he would very generously agreed to, to do an interview looking at his 10 years as, a, as an international cricketer. So it's almost to the week. I think it's maybe two or three weeks from now will be his 10-year anniversary as an England cricketer. Nagpur, that f- uh, deciding test match in effect against India... And he, he he made four he hit four 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 boundaries in two hundred and something balls all with a giggle and a smile, drove the Indian bowlers to to distraction and began one of the one of the great mm. Test match careers as an Englishman perhaps the greatest Test match career of an Englishman. It's certainly fair to have those kinds of conversations and uh, it's showing no signs of of heading south. Let's put it that way. Uh, and and he gave me an hour and there's always that sense of bemusement when you're talking to a living legend. I know it's a crap cliche, but that's what he is. Mm. No, I, I, but I, I, but there's, yeah. also, there's also a sense of bemusement from him as well. Now, I've, I've never interviewed a player in this game who is uh, less affected by his, his genius than Joe Root. And I don't think it's an act. I think he's genuinely bemused by the hoopla around him. Uh, this is a fellow who is gently baffled by fame and its trappings and what it amounts to and the doors that open and the adulation that comes your way. I think he's he's, he's just as baffled by it as people like us who don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's generous and lovely i'm afraid to to say you know that there, mm. there's no there's not going to be any great revelations there's not going to be any tittle tattle in this article but we spoke for an hour we're speaking again after this game uh, in the uae to follow up on a few more points and it's hopefully going to come out as a as as a yeah look an unashamed celebration of 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 the man's career and his contribution to English cricket he was very good on the technical side of things actually and the involvement of his game you mentioned Steve Smith having changed quite dramatically his 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 technique in recent times Joe's gone through similar things um uh Nasser actually helped him along the along the line I spoke to Nasser about this uh and Nasser was very much I don't want any don't want anything to do with this praise idea but you know he's, he's he's very good on him of course from a albeit from a distance and it's just uh, you, 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 you're in the in the in the presence of something very very special, mm. unique really. Um, uh, and he is is the greatest. He's the greatest of our time. He's the greatest English batsman of our time for sure. Uh, and yet he does it. And he's either a great actor. He's either the Anthony Hopkins of his generation, or he genuinely is as unaffected by it as he appears to mm. be. But you don't want to give too much away. That's just the top line, mate. Uh, so, Sorry, yeah, that, you might that, want to chop that. that. That interview will be in the next Wisdom Cricket Monthly. That interview will be out in a couple of weeks, yeah. And uh, that's that's one notable anniversary coming up. Another one that also comes up during England's tour of Pakistan is it'll be 20 years of Anderson as an England player during this tour. He made his debut December 2002 in an ODI against Australia. So I think we'll do something on the pod to celebrate that as well. 
Anyway, well done for getting to the end of the show. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Ben. Happy thanks. birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for listening, folks. We'll be back next Monday with Mark Butcher with us in the studio. If you enjoy the show, tell your friends. And if you're feeling especially kind, it is my birthday after all. Please do consider giving us a five-star review on either the podcast app or Spotify. <laughs>